And now let's talk about the farmers bills that were rammed through parliament last week. On Sunday, the Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce, that is the Promotion and Facilitation Bill, and the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill were passed by the Rajya Sabha with a voice vote. That means that an actual numerical vote or a division of votes was not taken. The bills were heavily opposed in the Rajya Sabha where the BJP and its allies did not have a majority. In fact, opposition members had moved resolutions calling for the bills to be referred to a select committee. But the deputy chairman of the Rajya Sabha did not allow for that and the bills were passed with a voice vote. This is yet another instance of the government throwing all democratic norms to the winds, something we have been witnessing for years now. Opposition parties and farmers' organizations have been opposing these bills for months now. They say it will give a free rein to private players and corporates and the farmers will suffer. We talked to Viju Krishna, the All India Kisan Sabha, on this issue. First of all, Viju, could you start by telling us about how these bills were passed yesterday, the whole process itself, because we do know that there was a lot of opposition inside the house as well, but the government pushed through nonetheless. What we witnessed yesterday in parliament is the uh, darkest, uh, it's the uh, most shameful incident with the deputy chairman disallowing the rights of the members of parliament. There were statutory resolutions put by different members of parliament they, could uh, they had asked for sending these bills to select committees. These should have been voted upon. There should have been discussion and uh, voting on that. Nothing of that sort was allowed. And uh, just without uh, on voice vote, we already saw in the beginning itself how question hour was done away with. And citing the lockdown, the time has been curtailed. And we are, uh, yesterday we found that how, uh, the bills also it, it, it was not just passed in the proper democratic manner. It is throttling of democracy that was there and uh, coming as it uh, came from the uh, deputy chairman himself. And today we find that the, lead, uh, the different members of parliament from the opposition uh, parties, they have been suspended. If the Modi government feels that the protests against these anti-farmer bills can be um, suppressed in this manner, they are mistaken. Even as we are talking now, thousands of farmers are in protest in uh, Bangalore. Farmers, uh, agriculture workers, Dalits, from different organizations uniting against this bill. It is not just in Punjab or Haryana as some sections of the media try to put. We have been continuously having protests. And this uh, shameful incident in the parliament yesterday which they are now uh, trying to uh, cover up by acting against the leaders of the opposition. I think uh, their uh, undemocratic authoritarian face is exposed in front of the people of our country. Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned the media because a lot of discussion, let's take the bills one by one. The first one, of course, is the trade and commerce facilitation bill. And now a lot of discussion around this bill seems to have centered around the idea that this is actually going to free the farmers. It's going to give them more choices. And this is the end of a oppressive system of APMCs or agriculture produce marketing committees. It is the end of the age of middlemen and uh, arguments like that, which the media has very uncritically been repeating. So could you take us through actually what are the key objections that are being raised by farmers and farmers organizations about the bill? Actually, uh... When the ordinances were brought, the agriculture minister made this ridiculous claim that farmers did not get freedom in, on 15th August 1947. And it is Narendra Modi who on uh, 3rd June 2020 has granted the freedom to farmers uh, to sell anywhere they want. Firstly, the, it is a blatant lie that farmers didn't have the freedom to sell anywhere else. There's, there was no compulsion that they sell only in the APMC. But why were the APMCs uh, brought in, uh, firstly instituted? It was to ensure that the traders who were uh, exploiting the farmers, uh, that could be stopped, the big traders. And uh, there could be re uh, regulated uh, markets in which there would be a fair playing ground and farmers' interests would also be protected. That is what they are doing away with. And they are citing many things like middlemen and uh, uh, the farmers not benefiting from it and so on. It is uh, uh, literally throwing the baby with the bathwater. 
these are things which can be resolved by internal reforms what is required is expansion of the marketing infrastructure across the country the central government should uh, spend for that it uh, uh, instead of that what it's doing is it is saying that adanis and ambanis and uh, other big corporate companies also maybe Wal walmarts and uh, uh, others will come and buy from you directly and give you a better price those big names which each of these bills have uh, i i think uh, it it has to be uh, simplified for uh, people one is very clearly uh, mandi todo uh, sarkari kharid msp par sarkari kharid band karo that is uh, total deregulation of market and uh, uh, in a gradual manner phasing out the msp procurement which is there second is the um, uh, uh, Hoarding and uh, Black Marketing Promotion Act, that is the changes in the Essential Commodities Act. Uh, very clearly, we say Jama Khori and Kala Bazari Badao Kanun. And the third one is the uh, Corporate Contract Farming Act. The, these are the three uh, things, to put it simply. And uh, the protest against this is also arising precisely for this uh, reason that the government is in, uh, going ahead with the WTO recommendations. They have uh, the dictates of the uh, WTO repeatedly has been to cut farm subsidies, cut subsidies for uh, our public distribution system, food security uh, programs, and to uh, withdraw from public stock holding. This is exactly what the Shanta Kumar Commission uh, recommended. The B uh, senior BJP leader recommended this, and also states which are giving a bonus above the MSP. Uh, very clearly, the Shanta Kumar Commission said that from such states, there should be no procurement. You're going in that direction. Gradual withdrawal of the central government from all its responsibilities to ensure MSP. And this is from a government which in 2014 came to power by promising farmers the Swaminathan Commission uh, recommendation would be implemented that C2 plus 50, at least one and a half times the total cost of production would be ensured. So that is what is happening. Now they are saying we are not uh, in a position to do it. Don't worry, Adani and Ambani will do it for you. So, so what you farmers might very well know that's not going to uh, happen. Absolutely. So what we might be seeing is actually, uh, say, outside the what do you call it? the APMC system outside the MSP system? Corporates may come strike deals with farmers. Maybe initially, even they initially even offer a good price for one or two years, and then as they become the default uh, buyers from farmers, then what has happened with so many gig economies, for instance, in India? That initially you you create a, a system, and then after that, your farmers are at your mercy. Absolutely, you have correctly um, uh, placed the point that uh, initially there is a possibility that uh, some of the traders would pay better later we have found wherever the earlier systems of contract farming the most um, acclaimed uh, contract farming model was the kuppam model which chandrababu naidu came up with a israeli american company was uh, into contract farming they grew gherkins the farmers were forced to gherkins which is not consumed by um, even um, any farmer there, forget a farmer, even in India, the consumption is very less, except maybe the super rich who use it in their salads. Initially, they were uh, getting better prices than the other crops. Gradually, it started um, saying that uh, grading and such issues, that the size is not correct, it is, uh, shape is not correct. On those counts, farmers were denied the prices which was initially uh, uh, promised. Later, when international market uh, somewhere else there's an overproduction, then that also leads to a price crash. When there's a price crash internationally, that is that burden is transferred to the farmer. But when there is a price rise, the uh, there is no benefit uh, given to the farmer. That is what happens. Right. And this, I believe, is also in the context of the second bill we, will, we were talking about, which you described as the contract farming one. Could you just explain a bit also how? it changes what is the current situation, what is the change from the current situation that exists? See, uh, Prashant, actually the three bills are all interlinked. Mm -hmm. One is the uh, market um, being uh, deregulated and 
uh, slow gradually withdrawing on paper uh, even today the prime minister says msp and procurement will happen right but why would a trader go to the apmc and uh, pay the tax and all that and uh, buy this at the msp that is a uh, question which he has to answer what we are saying is then make it a legal right of the farmer that whoever buys from the farmer directly will pay the msp as per c2 plus 15 it should be a legal right they are not doing that exactly. only the name in one of the bill is named price guarantee no, not a single uh, point about how this price is guaranteed is mentioned mm -hmm. uh, in and uh, you have the essential commodities act which is being changed which i said is the hoarding and uh, uh, so all three are interlinked and third one is the contract uh, farm repeatedly model contract farming they have been trying to impose through the uh, state uh, governments there has been resistance now this is the manner in which they are trying to bring and uh, the added uh, point is that the rights of the state agriculture has been a state subject uh, under the federal system and uh, uh, totally uh, riding roughshod over Uh, the rights of the states that is what is happening contract farming uh, in all cases we have seen it is an unequal system in which the small farmers of our country are having no protection at all absolutely right and would you could you talk a bit also about the protests that are uh, being planned that are going on right now as you said there is a tendency uh, in many uh, media organizations to only talk about the recent protests in punjab and haryana and make it sound like it is just one section of the farmers in one part of the country who are worried whereas like you pointed out this has been an ongoing agitation in fact on news click itself we have talked about some of these agitations in the past so could you also give us a trajectory of what protests have taken place and what is likely to happen in the coming days and weeks actually uh, when the ordinances were brought immediately we came out with protests against that uh, first in terms of uh, uh, press statements and memorandums and so on and then on 10th across the country these ordinances and the amendments proposed to the electricity act were burnt our experience was in more than 3500 centers across the country these ordinances were burnt we later ha have had that is even before this concerted protests which are going on now which media is showing us though it is only in punjab and haryana even before that on august 9th we had a jail bharo across the country supported by the trade unions and the aikcc also coming uh, in support of that uh, on 5th september we had a joint worker present mazdoor kisan um, day was observed where these issues have been raised farmers across the country have written um, email sent letters and sent emails to the prime minister the pmo should mention how many letters have come what is the kind of response from the field that is not uh, at all coming and even as i am talking today uh, there is a massive protest going on in bangalore where the farmers organizations agriculture workers organizations as well as dalit organizations have come together it's a massive protest which is going on uh, these protests are continuing 25th september uh, has uh, all india kisan sangharsh coordination committee has called for a resistance day pratirodh divas which will be observed in different ways punjab haryana and possibly tamil nadu are thinking of a band on the, that day others would have uh, different ways of uh, protest 28th we are going to again expose the uh, pro corporate um, approach anti uh, the undemocratic uh, manner in which they are pushing through this government which if it if it is confident this is for the benefit of the farmers they could as well have discussed this uh, ordinance had time till december they could have had wider consultations strengthened um, ensured that all uh, whatever doubts or confusions are there that is cleared and brought a bill unanimously two bills had been placed by farmers themselves in the parliament uh, one is to ensure guaranteed remunerative price and another for freedom from indebtedness it would have been good if the government had first looked into those um, before going into this if their interest was really pro uh, to benefit the farmers 
actually it is at the bidding of the corporate uh, cronies that they are bringing these bills. Right. Thank you so much, Viju, for talking to us, and we'll be continuously talking to you as the protests continue as well. In our next segment, we talk to NewsClick's Prabir Purkayasta on the recent U.S. moves against Chinese tech firms. He explains the global impact of these moves, especially in the trade and technology sectors. Prabir, to quickly begin with, what do you, uh, how do you see the latest last two days of developments? You talked about this before, of course, but again, this marks a very concrete step, and it now looks like China, after holding back for quite some time and hoping that saner councils might prevail, is likely to take action as well. Well. This is really fracturing the world on a number of fault lines, not one. So one of it we have already been commenting on, the trade come tech war. That's one element of it. But it also has now the prospect of fracturing the world on financial issues, financial terms, and we'll discuss how that's likely to happen. But also in terms of the supply chains, because the US and China are the biggest economies in the world. They had trade relations. There's an enormous amount of trade that goes on between the two. And if that relationship fractures, then we're going to see, of course, the consequences on a wide range of issues. And the last is, of course, the internet, you know, which has been regarded as something which everybody accepts is common, it's, uh, communications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if this trend starts to develop further, then we are likely to see the internet fracture into a number of national networks. Right. And then we are going to see a qualitatively different future than what we have seen till today. So I think there is, there's a huge number of issues over here. But taking up the first issue that you raised, one is, of course, that WeChat has been banned. So that's almost immediate. But TikTok has given, been given a reprieve of a different kind. No more uh, downloads of TikTok are possible, but they have 100 million users in the United States. They can still use it till November 12th without any fresh downloads, which means TikTok still gets a certain kind of grace period within which then whether Oracle can settle its accounts, convince the United States and have either ByteDance hand over the TikTok app completely to them, or ByteDance itself or TikTok headquarters itself in the United States. All of these are there. In, in, a, prep, in a step that preceded this, Chinese had already said that a lot of the software technology that TikTok holds or ByteDance holds, that is subject to export restrictions because that's artificial tools that they are using other software tools they're using. So there are export control regulations that are there. So they had made clear that transferring TikTok by dances property will not be that easy. Right. And Chinese would have a say on that. Even if by dance therefore loses a considerable amount of its uh, money, because if it could sell, for instance, uh, the uh, TikTok, even in the United States and four or five other countries that was being talked of, all of which are headquarters of which was the US arm of TikTok, then that would, could conceivably would be 10 to $20 billion. So that's a money uh, ByteDance would have had. Under normal course, probably even more. Because TikTok, right. as you know, was a really uh, an app which was having enormous amount of spread among the youngsters, teenagers. So this is one part. And you also talked about the other response that China has said. They had prepared, just like the US is preparing entities list, they had an unreliable entities list in which a lot of the big American companies are there. So if they now say that all those unreliable entities which are there, we will not buy equipment from them, we will not buy goods from them, what you are going to see therefore is a cascading effect that, for instance, Boeing, of course, Boeing itself is in the, down in the dumps at the moment. But if it wasn't, it would not have been able to access the Chinese market because it would be considered an unreliable entity. So how many of these players, and China is a big buyer of American goods as well. If that happens, then others will benefit. It could be Chinese local companies, of course, but it could also be European companies. We are not in the race at the moment because we have also decided to 
follow the American route, banning apps and so on. Right. So I don't think at the moment will be looked upon, Indian companies will be looked upon as particularly reliable entities either. But given the fact that our footprint has been relatively much smaller in China, it makes a difference to us, but may not make such a big difference to us in the long run. But definitely for the Chinese and American trade, it means essentially sundering, breaking apart the supply chains which have bound them together. And if the Americans are not going to supply chips and other equipment to the Chinese, then there is a huge number of companies in China who buy these chips. But the major Chinese chip manufacturers do consider China as a big market for them. So that was already happening with the Huawei issue. But now with this, we are really starting to look at uh, retaliation, possibly from the Chinese companies, uh, Chinese side. I think part of it, they were holding off thinking, if it lasts till the elections, let's see what the uh, new administration does. But let's be clear that whether it's a Biden administration or a Trump administration, these processes that have been set uh, at large, I think these processes will continue and there is going to be a large amount of bipartisan support on the issue of China at the moment. So I think you are going to see a slow unraveling of the global trade system with this step and certainly a sundering of technologies and also the internet. So these are the, the new elements that are coming in. And I think therefore this particular step that the US has now taken may not appear by itself as the big one, but this is finally the one in which Thai Chinese are now, I think, considering retaliation. Whether they'll hold off till November, we do not know. But it does appear they're preparing the grounds for retaliation as well. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.